And uh, today I want to give thanks to our panel that's here. Let's give them a round of applause. It is an honor for me to host this event here, for us to host this, this event here at Garfield High School. As you know, this is the Council of State Governments Justice Center event. So it's a, a day where we're going to have some discussion on how to improve the lives of our children. And that's always something that we do here at Garfield. So today they asked me to give you a little snapshot, just for about five minutes. Usually I have a 45 minute presentation, but I'm not going to go that long. It's uh, just a little snapshot of some of the things that we're doing here at Garfield. Okay, so bear with me. You saw the new building out in front. We're really proud. This is like the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion out here, the state of the art auditorium. For many years, we didn't have a venue where our kids can showcase their talents in the arts. But we are so proud to finally have this here, where just the other day, I almost had a tear in my eye watching these kids perform. And uh, they were playing rock music, they were reading poetry, they were dancing, they were doing so many things. And uh, finally, we're going to have an opportunity to showcase that. And uh, we're really proud of that. As you know, academically, we're doing really well here at Garfield. And I will share a little of our improvement in a little bit. So now we get to seal the deal with not only achieving academically, but also uh, having the arts in place once again at Garfield. This first slide here that you see, that's the, that's the picture of our old building, okay? Right before uh, the incident occurred uh, in 20, uh, 2007, we had a, a fire that destroyed the building, and so we now have our beautiful building now. When I came in on board about four and a half years ago, uh, we had some challenges here at Garfield High School. We, w there was talk of reconstitution. There was another, uh, another superintendent at the time, and there was talk of, of reconstitution. Our API, Academic Performance Index, had dipped about three points the year before. And there were even some town hall meetings to bid out the school. I remember I was working in the operations uh, department at the district, and I remember rooms filled with parents talking about where is this Garfield going to go? Because the superintendent at that time said, hey, Garfield has to show some progress and it's not doing it. So there's no more time to waste. We have children's education at stake. So they filled up town halls all over the city, all over this area. And I remember a local school district down the street was bidding for it, some charter schools, and so was Garfield. They came up with the plan. Not to get too much into that detail, after everybody voted, it was decided that Garfield would take over with a new plan that had to take, we had to make it real. So I came on board in January of 2010, and with this, I inherited this plan, and uh, it was, com it was uh, the work of students, teachers, administrators, and parents. So that made it very powerful. It was very idealistic. Really, I mean, we're talking about so many things in there, but we had to make it work. There was no time to waste. So we had our challenges back then, as you see in the slide. We were a program improvement, five plus plus, as many pluses as you can think of, school. Our API was 597 during the, the previous year, the 2008-2009 school year. Our, you know that our tar state target at the, is, has always been 800. We had overcrowded conditions. About 5,000 students here at Garfield. It never closed. It was one of the largest high schools in the country. I know that Roosevelt was also like that. Uh, like I mentioned, our auditorium was burned down, and we came in with lots and lots of bungalows in the back. We called it the village, back in the, behind the football field. So that replaced the, the classrooms in the main building for a while. Wasn't the best conditions. Some of the bungalows were more fit for elementary students, but we made it work. And as you'll see, we don't make excuses here at Garfield. We work with what we have. And our students and our parents have always been very supportive of that. So we had also, when I came in, over 600 suspensions the year before. So when I came in as a new principal, I knew we had to make a change. So, and that, as you know, suspensions, if you look in California, I think over 700,000 suspensions every year. I know that's. It's a lot less now, but that was the average. That's the way things, people would do things in the past. Kid misbehaved, uh, they went to the dean's office, nothing in between, and uh, many times they were just sent home for one day or two to calm the kid down and uh, 
made no sense to me at the time. But so we had to come up with a plan. So when I met with my teachers and with my assistant principals, I came in, I had, we needed a plan. We needed some ground, something to stand on. And that's important when you work with your schools. If there's no mission or no vision, and you're just trying to lower suspensions just for the heck of it, just because it's the thing to do nowadays and to work with the kids, folks, it's not gonna work. There's no magic bullet. I have school districts from Milwaukee coming, we had from New Mexico coming in, when they saw the data that I'm gonna share with you, coming to see our best practices, hoping to take something back so that they can work with and improve their schools. When they saw what it entailed for us to lower all this, all these things and make it a more positive environment, they were overwhelmed. We can't do all that. They wanted forms. They wanted me to show them when a kid misbehaves, what do you give them? How many standards? What do you do with this kid? It's deeper than that. If that's what you're looking for, to put a Band-Aid over the situation, it's not going to work. There's talk about schools in some other districts that are maybe hiding the suspension rate or anything like that. Uh, just, to, just to cover some numbers, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how you find out if they're covering numbers. Just visit that school. Visit that school and you'll see. If there's chaos, there's no organization, there's no structure, kids are all over the place, you're going to realize, hey, and the suspension is low, there might be something going on there. But when you walk to a school, that everything's in place, the kids are in class, like you'll see here, although today's the last day of school, uh, you'll see that during the school day, many people come and visit and they say, hey, Art, don't you have kids in class? Yeah, we do, but they're all in class. They're not walking around, they're not ditching, it doesn't happen anymore. There was a time when that was prevalent, but you'll see in a little bit what we had to do. Uh, we had to meet with the teachers and we had to let them know that all courses must address the California standards with innovation. Sure, we have these standards. We're not trying to tell you how to teach. You're the experts. We want you to use innovation, get creative. You know your kids best. If it's coming up to the class and doing some project-based learning, so be it. If it's about uh, writing skills, if that's what you need to improve on, if those kids are good with that, collaboration groups, anything you need, in that sense, that's what you have to do. Okay, so. The teachers knew right off the start what I expected to see in the classrooms. Then we looked at data, and I know it's a cliche, but we looked at data, and it drove our decisions. If I saw a, a teacher that had great scores in Algebra 1, for example, and the following year they would tell Mr. Huerta, you know, I've done my time in Algebra 1. I want to go up to teach calculus. You know what, sir? I'm sorry. You're my Algebra 1 expert. I need you to continue teaching Algebra 1. And I would discuss with the person and he would say, you know what, you're right. And I had many of those discussions because you have to have those conversations. And once everybody buys into it, we realize why we're doing it and you'll, we'll see the results. We had to improve uh, parent involvement. You can't do it without the parents. I know that's another thing everyone listens to, hears about. But if you go to our parent center here, we have over 80 parents every single day helping us out inside the classrooms. They're also helping us with supervision. We give them workshops. If we, whatever I cover with my faculty, I cover with my parents. We're all part of the same team. So there's no surprises. Anything that we cover with anyone else, the parents are always involved. And uh, they also get workshops in mathematics, in language arts, so that they can see what's being incorporated in the classroom. Therefore, they can help their kids with homework. We had to improve attendance. Kids were not wanting to come to school. Why was that? I know well, and we all know well. I know I'm teaching to the choir. There needs to be a connectedness. There needs to, the kids need to be connected. We had to personalize the instruction. So we had all this huge, this huge school. So we decided to make it break, it, break it down into five academies in the school. So we have five pathways that students can choose. So each school, if you will, has a counselor. We used to have two counselors per SLC. That was great. And uh, we had two counselors. We had the same teachers. Most of them are in the same building. But we don't limit their, their, their choices in whatever their, PLC or their SLC offers. If they wanted a jazz class or they wanted a calculus class that their SLC, their small learning community, didn't offer, they can passport and take it wherever it's offered. Very flexible. We need to meet the needs of the kids. We have about 25 advanced placement courses here at Garfield many courses. So we know 
We knew what, what, what the needs were. So, and we knew that we had to improve graduation rates. So that all, all that is fun and, and everyone talks about it, but data doesn't lie. We had to come up with a plan. So what did we do? I had to, and I don't have a slide on this, but I had to improve the instructional piece at Garfield. So we, we have professional learning communities. Every week, a, the teachers give up one of their conference periods to meet as a content area group. So all the Algebra One teachers work together and they share best practices. They look at lessons, they create lessons, they look at what's worked and what hasn't worked. They visit each other's classrooms on the days and we get sub coverage for them. So it just visualize, every day of the week, there are professional learning communities going on. Powerful conversations. It wasn't easy at first because we have a union and, and, and you know, and so, but we, went, we met together. I brought them on the, to the table, my UTLA chair, and we came up with, an, with a plan and it's worked. You have to get creative, you have to go on board. So, so they're telling me I have to hurry. So here we go. Let me just get to the numbers. So when I got here, look at the API, 553. Okay, it was 550, well actually, it was 593 in 2008, 2009. Then 632, then we when after my year and a half, we went up to 705, we went up 75 points. I think we went up the highest and the highest growth in with, within compre comprehensive high schools in the state. And then we went up to 716, 714. So from 632, 593 all the way to 714 with all these systems in place that I talked about. Suspensions, 538 in 2007 and 2008. 2008, 2009, uh, 683. When I got here mid-year in 2009, 2010, we already had 110 suspensions. That wasn't my fault right there. So we, had, we didn't suspend after that, okay? And then after that, you can see 2010, 11, 1, 1, 1, and today's the last day of school. I'm gonna knock on wood. We have zero. Our four-year cohort graduation rate, which is big. Look at, look at 2008. At Garfield High School, 45% were graduating. And that's looking at the four-year rate. So you're looking at how many kids came in the ninth grade, and of those ninth graders, four years later, how many graduated? Sure, some leave the state and it counts against us, or uh, they go to another school that counts against us. Uh, but 54%, when I got here, I looked at it, 57%. What's happening with these kids? So we improved all the things that I talked about. 71%, folks, we're at 87.3% this year, last year. This year, I think we're gonna hit the 90%, okay? So look at our Casey, our Casey rates for this year. Uh, in ELA, number of students tested with 575, numbers of students that passed, 469. So 82% passed, and this is including special ed and everybody that we, every kid at, at, Gar at Garfield. We have a 15% special ed program here. 15% of our students are in the special ed program. We're really proud of their growth. They're doing amazing things. So, eight, and we have a large EL population as well, as you can imagine. So look at that, 82% of 10th graders that took the test for the first time passed it. In mathematics, we're blowing a lot of people away. We, we have an intense mathematics program here. 86% passed it. So those are good things happening. And I couldn't get the, the uh, college information for this year because my college counselor is still getting all the numbers together, but I'll give you last year's. They told me that, well, 96% of our students ended up going to, a, to college, either two-year or four-year. Last year, 27 of our kids were admitted to UCLA, and I heard that's an unofficial state record for one school to have so many kids going to one, high, uh, one college, one university. And they're going all over the place. You can see they're going to that. Last year, they went to UCs, privates, community colleges, CSUs. This year, we have kids going to Dartmouth, Wellesley, Boston U. We have kids going to Vassar, they're going all over the place and there's stories. I know I shared it with some folks at the district. They wanted to highlight some of our students. And uh, folks, these kids are coming back and they, we invite them back, it's uh, strategic. And they come back and we hold an assembly like right when they take their break from college or during spring break, they come over when they visit their folks and they come and speak to our kids and they motivate them. 
Our kids are going to the best universities in this country, and uh, we're so proud of everything they're doing. So if you put all those things together, teachers working together, parents involved in your school, hiring the best teachers, and I'll tell you, the system principals, they go through strenuous uh, interview process. I do not hire anybody that doesn't have the passion to work with, my, with these students here. So you put all those things together. Also, the community-based organizations, Bienvenidos, Talacu, Mela, so many others, uh, is amazing. We, could, we have a clinic here, a wellness center. Our school police officer that we have, our resident officer here, amazing guy. He is a counselor to the students. If you see them at prom or at any event, every kid wants to take a picture with him because he's a positive role model, positive role model. If that happens anywhere else, I'm not sure, but it does occur here at Garfield. So we're really proud of everything that these kids are accomplishing, and we have so much more to do, but we're going to get there. And I'll tell you, the community here is really proud of, of our students, and tomorrow we're going to graduate about 500 students at East LA College, and we'll have about 10,000 people in attendance to watch that. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. So <clears throat> at this time, and remember, we can't do any, any of this without the support of our leaders. At this time, I would love to introduce, it, it is an honor for me to introduce a person that's been really supportive, really great man, Mr. John Daisy, our superintendent. Thank you, Jose. I was confused. I, you are proud of Garfield? Is that, I'm trying to make sure of that. Um, I think the single, um, with no joking whatsoever, the single greatest compliment I could pay you in this school is if my kids were younger, I would want them to be a bulldog um, and a graduate of Garfield. It is an astonishing story of taking matters into your own hand and not denying the fact that um, there is no shame, uh, there is uh, no blame, but there are no excuses that every single um, youth matters. Welcome to uh, the east side of Los Angeles. Um, we are the nation's second largest public school system. Uh, we are America only sooner, and we're coming to a hometown near you. Um, what we deal with in LA and our successes and the challenges we have is very much a part of what takes place in the United States. I'll give you two seconds of context if you don't know LA. Um, and then if you do, it's great to remember it. And then I want to offer about three or four minutes of, of comments about how proud I am and how far we have to, to go around that. Uh, before I do that, I just do want the um, privilege of recognizing my vice president of the school board. We are a seven-member school board that governs, uh, the, actually for a school board, the largest school district in the United States. And there is no single uh, more powerful advocate for the work that we're going to talk about uh, than board member Steve Zimmer, who's part of his own career in life has been to do this work. So, sir, I thank you very much for, for being with us. <clears throat> and I suspect he, like I, are going to leave. We only have about 30 graduations and promotions today across the city, and parents want us there too, so it's no disrespect um, when we go uh, to do that. Um, so we run a preschool program, we run an adult education program, we run a K through 12 program, 909,000 youth. Uh, I have the privilege of being the leader of every single day in Los Angeles. The overwhelming majority of our youth live in circumstances of poverty. Um, we speak 109 languages uh, and we are 760 square miles of opportunity for students. Um, more than 87% of our youth live at or below poverty. Um, the overwhelming majority of our youth were very diverse. The overwhelming majority of our youth are Latina, Latino. Uh, we have the second in order of populations that um, bring the richness of diversity are black, African, diaspora. Then we have Korean. Uh, then we have Chinese, uh, Laotian, uh, Farsi, Jordanian, Iranian. Uh, and then a small percentage of our youth are Anglo. Um, and uh, on average, 16,000 students are homeless, many more in shelters, uh, and every single one of them wants to be you. They want to graduate college workforce ready. They want to participate in this thing called the American Dream. And we are not confused about our mission in Los Angeles. Our mission is to lift youth out of poverty, 
and to create the next generation of people in this country who will lead and have a roof over their head and at least living wage and health care and hopefully one day full, full in this country uh, immigration reform so that no student uh, needs to live in the shadows. It's a very big issue here in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm proud of this report. I'm proud of LAUSD because so much of this report, LA led the way in California and in the nation. I'm going to say a few things we're proud of and talk about a few things that we have a lot of work ahead of us. So we're nowhere where we used to be, not where we want to be uh, at the moment till those numbers are at 100%. Uh, percent. In many ways, um, the, we put the mechanisms into place uh, that are laid out in the consensus report so that we could have positive uh, school climate. We have implemented a number of strategies. In 2007, uh, the Board of Education adopted a new discipline foundation policy, which began this work. And in no um, joking, uh, the, the proof points of this emanated from this school um, in terms of showing that it is positive, it is possible, uh, and it's absolutely good for youth. I came to the board, <clears throat> closing my fourth year of the privilege of serving, and early on, I was told, you know, Daisy, you've got a lot of issues you have to work on, but you have a huge dropout problem. And so I began, obviously, visiting high schools, former high school principal, and I was visiting high schools, and it wasn't squaring with me. I just was not seeing hundreds of kids dropping out and just looking for employment and just leaving school because they could do something and they were uh, not there. And I began to look at the data through dropouts while we have them and we do our best to recover them. It just wasn't there. And I'm like, what are we talking about here? So we dug deep into district-wide data through our performance dialogues. <coughs> and I visited schools. And what I began to realize is we had an extraordinarily high out-of-school suspension. But it was grossly disproportional um, for the youth who were being suspended out of school. And so I took a look at that. And if you were uh, a young black youth in LAUSD, you had a nine times higher suspension rate than any other group. And I just gave you that data at the beginning, and you are not the majority group in LAUSD. So you had gross disproportionality with that. Uh, and we took a look at that. And what I realized was we did not have an extraordinary dropout problem. We had a push-out problem. We were pushing youth out the door facilitating them by closing the door in back of them and saying, don't come back. That's correctable. That was on our shoulders. So I began to look at the suspensions and I said, okay, kids must be like, because in California, you must, and um, I would argue we will and should spend youth who bring or use a weapon, who sell or use drugs, who strike an individual. There are five uh, very grossly uh, inappropriate behaviors that that consequence is for. And yet when I was looking at the school board data, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of students were being expelled for that. So I said, what is going on? The schools must be riddled with kids who are, you know, grossly misbehaving. I walked through high schools, it doesn't look like that at all. So I said, okay, I want every single suspension for the last two years coded. And what we found out was, just like we suspected, tiny fraction of youth doing very bad things, we handled those. Overwhelmingly, suspensions were in this one category called willful defiance. And so I said, wow, I must be missing those classes. Kids standing on desks, flipping off teachers, screaming, yelling, wasn't seeing it. Took a deeper look, didn't see it. So I said, okay, I want the write-up of every single solitary willful defiance. And it was a distressing meeting. It was a very distressing meeting. Repeated failure to bring book to class. Not handing in homework. Not picking up paper off a floor. Looking at me the wrong way looking at me in a threatening manner. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is adolescence. That is not willful defiance. That's why they come to school with us to help youth grow to be young, mature adults in a phase that we get the privilege of being with. So I came to the board and I said, would you write a resolution? Usually it's the other way around. The board writes resolutions to tell the superintendents what to do. We worked as an absolute team. We need to strike it out as the ability to suspend anybody for that. And last year, the board amended the discipline policy for LAUSD, where we ended the use of willful defiance as a mean to suspend. We passed, this board passed um, the Student Climate Bill of Rights, and we began 
um, the entire uh, policy across this entire district of positive school-wide behavior and intervention as a program. Again, taking our lessons from Garfield across this district. The data is compelling. So from 2011, when we began this work uh, to last year, this year is it's going to close out today, but I also know the data because we look at each month and it will be yet positive again. You know, we've cut suspensions in LAUSD by some 12,000 annually. We have taken a look at um, suspension rates per hundred of student for African American youth, which were 12 down to 6.9. We've taken our Latino suspension rate from three to 1.6 per 100 youth. Our white suspension rate from two to one in LAUSD. We've cut by nearly 50% our incidences of suspension. It is no surprise, and we're incredibly pleased that we are seeing our student achievement rates, our graduation rates, our attendance rates, and our state achievement rates at every grade in every subject at the highest they have ever been in LAUSD. If you stay with us, you will learn with us. If we push you out, we don't do well. And so it's completely, completely confirmational of the work. And everyone's involved. This is no one single person or no one program effort. Our school police, our counselors, our leaders, our teachers, our unions, our cafeteria support, our nurses are all part of attempting to change the climate in school of one that has consequence and acceptance together, as opposed to rejection and pushing you away as the way to deal with adolescent behavior around that. Incredibly proud of the work that we have done, given the size of this district. It is no shock that the statistics in the state of California have dropped as well. California can't get better or can't get worse unless LAUSD does. You know, we're a little over a tenth of the whole state. We run the state when it comes to data. And so if you're watching drop in suspension rates in California, you are watching it because of LAUSD. If you're watching a rise in achievement, it's because of LAUSD. Conversely, if you're watching a drop in achievement at the state, we are also complicit in that as well. So we take that really seriously um, in LA. We have put into place, some people call it deep scrutiny, we call it performance dialogues. Every month, we take a topic and drill down on it from school to school. Every single high school's suspension rate by month. Every single high school's attendance rate by month. Achievement rate by month. But not just that. Is this happening because we are overlooking students with IEPs? Is this happening because one group of students is still disproportionately done? We take a look at all of that around that. It's necessary to hold our belief that it's an all youth achieving goal and policy. Incredibly proud. I could end the conversation here. We could go off, we could clap, I could feel good, and I do. But the reality is we have more work in front of us. We have still far too many students who need to feel different, who need to feel unique forms of acceptance. A student who goes home to no home, who lives in a car in Huntington Park High School, a student who is ill, a student who has no parents, a student who has both parents but they happen to be incarcerated, all need four very different forms of support and acceptance around that. Customizing this and individualizing this is still in front of us. I am glad that we have the opportunity to do it. I just happen to be very impatient about that. What I do know is it's not going to happen unless I have 1,019, because that's the number of schools we have the privilege of serving, principals like Huerta. And so one of the things that we think about is we're not going to find the answers from outside experts. We bring people here to understand how it happens here. We bring people to Cesar Chavez Learning Campus in the San Fernando Valley to understand why it's happening there. We bring people to the community campuses like RFK schools, where we have elementary schools, preschools, middle schools, and high schools, to understand how it's happening there. Leadership from within has an obligation, yes, to do their work and to help us lift it as well. And so we hope you'll take from us today some things that we're learning, and we hope that we're clear about the fact that we still have growth to do, 
but we don't really want to come back in two years to the conference with the same data points. Um, so we're very compelled around the rights of students. They get one chance to be you or I, and we take that chance really seriously around that. I want to thank the team I have. It's about, uh, you live and die by your team in a district this large. And I want to thank um, uh, certainly our panelists, but in particular the folks from California um, who you know we have, um, we have very strong support in the capital of California around these issues. Um, if we didn't have laws that were, had our back, we were not likely to be able to do this one. And the person I'm going to get the privilege of introducing has been actually a stalwart and has been fearless about these issues. So I want to take a moment who is going to speak next to us and talk about Assemblyman Dickinson. He was elected to the California Assembly in November of 2012 and represents the 9th District. You might not know what that is, but Sacramento would be at the heart of the 9th District. He certainly has been focused on issues of education and environmental quality, health and human services for youth and families. In addition, consumer protection. He serves on a number of chairs, including banking and finance. He serves on accountability and admin review, budget, judiciary, natural resources. But <clears throat> he chairs a select committee on delinquency profession prevention and youth development. And you have been remarkably patient as we have paraded students up to meet with you and to advocate that this happen statewide. Prior to his election, Assemblyman Dickinson served on the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors where he played a key role in issues of health care, welfare reform, economic development. He has had many, many years of service, including on the Regional Transit Board, and he has also served on the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Commission. Uh, he is, uh, got his undergrad from UC Berkeley and his JD from the University of California in our backyard. So we are thrilled that you are here, and I am personally um, very grateful uh, for your support in leading your colleagues um, in Sacramento to continue to support the rights of students. Welcome. Well, good morning and thank you, uh, Superintendent, for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. It's all the time we have. Oh. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking the, the Council uh, on State Governments, uh, the California Endowment, all the partners in this in this project and of course the the bulldogs of of garfield high school and our host uh, principal jose huerta uh, who has done remarkable work here we're in a beautiful facility but the real beauty of what's happening here was described uh, by him in reducing the suspension rate keeping students in school uh, helping them to graduate and go on to uh, the direction of their choice whether it's college or a technical or vocational future but wherever they want to go, that's the story that we're here to, to talk about and to, to underscore. Uh, as um, was mentioned in the introduction, I spent almost 17 years as a Sacramento County Supervisor, and it's, it's important for me to be here today. I'm so pleased that I'm able to join you because this subject that is treated in this consensus report and the issues that, that embrace it and surround it are, are so critical to our future as Californians, uh, as, as Americans. Uh, during the course of my service uh, at, the, at the county level, uh, I, came, I came to realize profoundly that if, if our students weren't doing well in school, then they became the uh, object of attention, uh, not always wanted, of our counties. Um, they became the, the kids uh, that our probation department had to deal with our sheriff's department had to deal with, that were uh, in families on, on public assistance, um, that had mental health uh, or other issues that needed to be uh, addressed. And instead of having lives which gave them the chance to succeed, uh, to become uh, ultimately, if you, if you want to be uh, quantitative about it, uh, taxpayers, uh, they, they became the students who grew into adults who became the tax takers without a future uh, of, of their own. Uh, and as I became more and deeply involved in issues related to children and families during, during those years, uh, it, led me into, it led me into efforts to try to, to reduce and prevent gang violence, to strengthen 
uh, children and, and families. I chaired Sacramento First Five for the first 10 years of its existence. And in moving to the legislature, uh, it was apparent to me that these weren't issues uh, just of uh, importance and significance in Sacramento County, but they were truly uh, throughout California in many instances, especially when we talk about student discipline uh, across the entire uh, country. Uh, therefore, I, I ask the, the speaker to allow me to chair a select committee on delinquency prevention and youth development. Uh, speaker Perez at the time uh, kindly consented uh, to that. Uh, and we have, through our select committee, been able to develop a number of pieces of legislation and support uh, others that, that I think have been in, uh, important in changing the direction and, and raising awareness in California uh, of, the, of these issues and about, about these issues. And I want to give a, a, a special note of, of thanks and recognition to Miriam Krinsky for uh, her work with my staff and me on these, on these issues. Uh, in fact, it was a uh, uh, hearing that, that my select committee held in December of 2011 that focused on school discipline uh, that inspired me to uh, dig even more deeply into this issue and, and uh, to introduce uh, several pieces of of legislation because one can't ignore the facts. One simply cannot ignore the facts. And the facts in California are that we suspend 2,200 students a day out of school. The facts are that in the course of a year, more students are suspended out of school than graduate. As was mentioned, over 700,000 suspensions a year. And while we are making progress in reducing those, those suspensions, and you've heard some of the, the evidence of that already the, this morning, the suspension rate is still uh, far too high. We are still pushing far too many students uh, out of school. And we continue to do it uh, under the guise of, of willful defiance primarily, and we continue to do it in an extremely disproportionate way. And it's, on, it's unbalanced in a way that not only, not only costs those students the chance to succeed, but costs our neighborhoods and costs our state and communities. So we have been on a mission, if you will, uh, in, the, in the legislature, a number, a number of us, to take on this, on this issue, to bring some rationality to it, and to help, to help our colleagues understand that we have a choice. The choice is whether to take the steps necessary to keep students in a learning environment and on the right track, because every young person has the right to dream and the right to pursue those dreams. And we ought to be in the business of encouraging that and facilitating that and urging that. Or, or we can condemn our students to a, a life that leads them to the wrong track, to a track that takes away the hope, takes away, away the inspiration, reduces the dreams to a sad reality. It's our choice of what we do to help our young people stay on the right track or get lost on the wrong track. And we know that for just one suspension out of school, the probability for that student doubles that he or she will, will drop out. We know that for those students that are suspended out of school, that they are five to 11 times more likely to become involved in the juvenile justice or the criminal justice system. I would suggest to you, and. I know in this audience uh, you've already become aware of this and are among the converts, but I, I would suggest to you that this truly isn't rocket science. We know what we need to do. We know what will work. And in California, I'm happy to say that the governor signed five pieces of, of legislation uh, in 2012 that attacked the issue of how we deal with disciplinary policies at the, at the school district level. We haven't quite finished that work. There's still work yet to be done, and we have some work with the governor to do to convince him that the use of willful defiance needs to be reduced further in, in California. I have legislation, Assembly Bill 420, pending in the state Senate that hopefully we will reach an agreement with the governor on and be able to, to move to his desk for, for signature in the not too distant future. We also have a new approach to funding in our schools in, in California, giving much more authority back to the district level, to the school boards and the superintendents, 
to make choices about how they spend the money, but at the same time requiring them to be accountable for it by developing a local control accountability plan or LCAP as it's known. And this is, this is an approach that hopefully across the state will engage community members, parents, students, teachers, faculty, staff, administrators, the entire community in formulating an approach that emphasizes keeping kids in school and on the right track. We have more to do. As the superintendent noted, while we have made progress, there is still much left to accomplish in this, in this area. And this report that we are talking about today is important in that effort, not just for the recommendations that it makes, which are significant in their own right, but for the fact that it represents a consensus-based approach of bringing a multitude of partners together, of stakeholders, of all of those who have an investment, and we all do, all of those who have an investment in making sure our young people stay in school and on the right track. That's what makes this report so important because so often we end up with a debate, a debate that if I have to keep a kid in my class, then that kid will take all my time and take my time away as a teacher from, from being able to instruct the other students. We have to be able to address the issues of teacher training and credentialing, of giving teachers the resources and the support, the means of managing classrooms and schools, the methods of resolving, and managing, resolving conflict and managing classrooms. And we can do it. We're doing it in many places now across the state of California, here in Los Angeles as a leader. But we need to bring these approaches to the entire state of California so that every student, every student knows that he or she is valued, that he or she matters, that he or she is someone we want in school because, because he or she represents the future of California. Thanks very much. With that, I have the, I have the pleasure of, of introducing uh, the longest serving member of the, of the Texas State Legislature with a career of over, over 40 years of, di of distinction. He's known as the Dean of the State Senate in Texas, uh, representing a district uh, in uh, the Houston uh, area, and he chairs the Senate Criminal Justice Co Committee. He's also, also notably, the, the chair of the National School Discipline Consensus Project. And I'm delighted that he's joined us here in Los Angeles today for, for this event. Please join me in welcoming Senator John Whitmire. I could, I could quickly just say ditto to everything that Assemblyman Jacobson said, because he stole so much from our line because the Texas experience is so similar to the California experience. Unfortunately, we don't have enough assemblymen like Mr. Dickinson. In fact, when I got here this morning, I had reviewed his record, his legislative proposals and successes, and I knew I wanted to take him back to Texas with me because I'm looking for a House. We have a Senate in the Texas House of Representatives. I would love for him to be my House sponsor on so many of my proposals, particularly his area of zero tolerance to modify that really broken system of a young man in Texas forgetting that he had his pocket knife in his jeans and being suspended without looking at the circumstances in the common sense approach. But I was going to take Assemblyman Dickinson back with me, but after listening to the principal, now I want to take him back to Texas with me. Mr. Huerta uh, is outstanding. And then I listened to your superintendent, and hell, I want to take him back with me too. But it wouldn't be fair. It'd probably be easier for me to come and, and uh, and be a transport here. But listen, this is really why we run for office. As mentioned, I've been in office, 10 in the House, 32 in the Senate. This is why you run for re-election. This is why I knocked doors this spring after 42 years, for the opportunity to make a difference, and we are doing it as we gather this morning. That is why the community advocates go to work and work long hours. That's why teachers, administrators, get up and go to work. I told the superintendent, I said, Principal Huerta can't wait till the next day. 
Did you sense it? He, he probably looks, he's disappointed when a day comes to a conclusion, he finally has to go home. And that's why you and I are here today. And so let me thank you on behalf of the students. So often we do not have, they certainly don't have the opportunity to interact with you and thank you for what you've done because you are making a difference. Now, you might logically ask, why is a state senator from Texas here today? And how did he get the opportunity to work with the consensus group? It's because I've chaired criminal justice in Texas for over 20 years, working for reforms, alternatives, diversions to incarceration. And I'm proud and excited. We've been actually able to shut down three adult prisons in the last two sessions. Remarkable for a tough on crime state. But we've become smart on crime. And I get a lot of pushback. But in that experience, I started about 10 years ago hearing what I would call horror stories about how they are criminalizing student behavior. School discipline enforcement became a crime. Whether it's ticketing for truancy, $500 fine, $80 court cost. Did anyone ever go to the home to see the root cause of the truancy? No, they didn't. And I passed a bill saying you don't ticket for truancy, and our Governor Perry vetoed it, but it would be the first bill that I introduced next session under a new governor. But also, the whole concept of school discipline became so broken. Now, as I've mentioned, I spent a lot of time with the adult inmates, and certainly the juveniles confined. They have a lot of common denominators. One, obviously, is a lot of them have addictions with drug and alcohol. A lot of mental health experience. But you know the other one that they have in common? They have had a bad school experience. I will take you to a facility in Texas that confines 200 youth just outside Austin. A hundred percent of them have been suspended one or more times before they entered the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system. So let's just make it real clear why we're here today. It's not just to end suspensions. It's to make a more productive. The graduation rate at Garfield is, is remarkable. I'm taking that back to Texas with me, too. To see an inner city school in L.A. with an 83% graduation rate is something to celebrate. And that deals with suspension and school discipline, expulsions. So as I heard the reports coming in, Senator, they're, they're suspending them for being out of their seat, throwing the right ticketing in Texas. School police officers. When I used to drop my junior high daughter off 15 years ago, I was so excited to see an officer at the front gate to keep the bad influences, the guns, the drugs off campus. But somewhere along the line, sir, in Texas, the expansion of school police departments, they got either bored wanted to hire more officers, more equipment, and they started coming into the school with their ticket book, going up and down the hall, throwing an eraser, a curse word, too much perfume in the hall would get you a Class C disorderly conduct ticket. Disorderly conduct ticket. You got profile ticketed, and for certain, you were suspended or expelled. So I kept hearing these reports, so I said, man, we got to study this. We have 1,050 school districts in Texas. So through the Justice Center, we did a study three years ago. Now, we were fortunate that Texas keeps more data than other states. Big factor. So we were able to review the suspension experience in all 1,050 school districts. Folks, it was shocking. Shocking if you have a conscience. School districts, different next door to each other. Within the same school district, one campus suspends large numbers, others don't. So we started seeing it's very subjective. It has to do with leadership, starting at the top, and the policies. Here's the outrageous, unconscionable factor that we ran across as it relates to minority students. In Texas, 60% of our students have been suspended one or more times. That in itself is a broken system that has to be fixed. But 83% of our minority students, 83% of our African-American students 
had been suspended more one time. Overrepresentation of our minority students in our GLBT community, our Hispanic community. It was shocking and outrageous. We went to work on it. We had hearings. I've introduced legislation against ticketing, against truancy. At the very top, our Commissioner of Education is holding school districts accountable. They must report their suspensions, and we've made a difference. Now, let me quickly say, as we heard from your superintendent, in Texas, we say we've come a long ways, but we've got a long ways to go. Just in the last month, a school district outside of Houston, outside of Dallas, Duncanville, last month suspended 150 students for dress code violations. In one day, they called 150 students to the library and suspended them for a lack of belt, lack of a collar on their shirt. I can't believe it. With all the discussion about suspensions and expulsions being overused, I called the superintendent. He said, well, Senator, we believe in accountability. I said, Mr. Superintendent, couldn't you have just taken them to the gymnasium? I understand dress codes matter to you. And have a community leader, a mentor, your local state senator come and speak to them about how it is important, your image and rules are made to be followed. Ladies and gentlemen, from our study that we're gonna to release today, in my Texas experience, nothing good comes from an out-of-school suspension. I just can't think of anything good. You send the student home to a community without supervision, often gang activity, bad influences. They return to school behind in their studies. They're profiled. They get a case number. Nothing good comes from it. In Houston last month, I learned that we had issued iPads to our graduating seniors for the spring semester. At one of our largest high schools, I read, three students did not follow instructions. They were looking at information on their iPad that were not allowed. And it was not pornography, it just wasn't the daily curriculum. Three day suspension, I called that superintendent. Couldn't you have just taken their iPads away from them? Common sense with the emphasis of keeping them in school. So we knew in Texas we'd run across something big, but we didn't know how big it was until we went national. We took this Texas experience and began studying over a year ago. You had Tony Smith from Oakland, excellent superintendent was part of our group. The California Endowment helped sponsor us. And so what we've found in which we're releasing today it's, it's a national issue. It's a national problem. And I'm here today, Assemblyman Dickinson, to partner with California. You've got it. I've got it. We've come a long ways, but we have a long ways to go, and we must take our message nationally. Nationally, because across this country, some states don't even keep the data. They don't even know who they suspend. They don't know the ethnicity of who they suspend. They lose them to suspension. So let me just tell you, I'm excited to be here. We've come a long ways. We've got a long ways to go. This report is a consensus. It allows a lot of discretion to local jurisdictions. We want local models. We want to learn from best practices across the state because let me emphasize that. Some communities are doing an outstanding job, and we need to learn from those instructors. Fort Bend, south of Houston, you know how they deal with truancy before it's a problem? They have a juvenile probation officer working the high school. He or she is assigned to meet the students and learn what their difficulties were. If it's a drug or alcohol issue, deal with it. Houston suspended a 14-year-old young lady last fall that I got involved in her truancy case. We have court managers in some of our school junior highs, before you go to court, they will actually send a manager to, to visit the student and family. Why, why do you think a 14-year-old in Houston did not go to school and was subsequently ticketed? Because she was pregnant, had no maternity clothes. 
the solution was to help her get her clothing, her self-esteem, her support to go back to school. So we've come a long ways. We've got a lot of work to do. It's a national issue. We have the support of the Justice Department. They've recognized how important it is, the Department of Education. But let me close by thanking Michael Thompson, who we'll hear about, and all the working group of over 100 people that have met over three times. We've come a long ways. We have a long ways to go, and we need your help. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Whitmire. For those of you who haven't had a chance to work with him, you can understand why uh, he's such an electrifying presence um, and why he's had such an impact on this issue in Texas. We come to you today in Los Angeles, having just been in uh, Austin, Texas yesterday, where uh, Senator Whitmire and the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court convened leaders from across the state to talk about this very issue as well as national leaders. And so. Uh, to Senator Whitmire, who's chaired this project, thank you very, very much for all you've done to lead this work. And to Assemblyman Dickinson, thank you very much for being our legislative liaison uh, here in California and really demonstrating how to get through some legislation that requires a lot of talking, uh, a lot of deliberation, um, but then actually getting it converted into law. So uh, thank you very much for all that you've done for this project uh, and for the state of California on these issues. I mentioned yesterday we were in the state Supreme Court um, talking about this issue, bringing in all three branches of government, but really where we need to be is where we are today, which is in a school demonstrating the kind of conditions for learning that uh, Principal Huerta uh, articulated so thoughtfully, uh, and then Superintendent DZ made clear was a priority for the entire school district. So thank you very much for having us here in Los Angeles and in such a wonderful school that embodies all the characteristics of what we're trying to highlight. Um, and I know we don't have too much time left in the program. Uh, what I want to do is just thank uh, a few additional people and then actually tell you what's in this report because I know we keep making reference to it but haven't actually described it. So uh, let me do that. Um, let me see if I can actually pull it up. Come in to... There you go. Um, so just in terms of people that I want to thank, we're going to talk about uh, 100 advisors uh, that uh, are experts in the field and helped guide this work, many of them here in California because of all the leadership that comes from this state. Uh, and many of them are sitting at this head table with us here. Uh, Superintendent uh, uh, Ramona Bishop, who you're going to hear from um, in a little while, from um, Vallejo uh, School District, uh, up north, further north in the state. Uh, Chief Jenkins, the Chief Probation Officer from San Diego. Judge Groman here in Los Angeles. Uh, Dan Lowson, a nationally known researcher uh, affiliated with UCLA. Maisie Chin, a fantastic uh, community advocate who's been talking about this issue and has an, an admirable fan club right here in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, as you know, um, Maisie and uh, community advocates here have been talking about this issue long before it got to the radar of the U.S. Attorney General and the Secretary of the Department of Education. We have you to thank for bringing this issue to the attention of folks initially. Um, and then, of course, others who are here in the audience, like Stefan Brown, uh, who's here from the Sacramento School District. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and to our funders uh, from the California Endowment, thank you for bringing us to California and helping us appreciate all the momentum that's occurring on this topic. Uh, Castle Redmond and Miriam Krinsky in particular, thank you for being here and your great colleagues over there, Mary Lou and Barbara as well. <clears throat> and then to my colleagues at the Council of State Government's Justice Center and two people in particular who are here, who are authors of the report, Martha Plotkin, uh, who was the director um, of this work and was instrumental in making sure we had a report that really brought all those different perspectives together, an incredibly difficult challenge for three years, uh, and with the terrific help of another co-author who's with us here today, Nina Solomon. So thank you very much for all your hard work. <clears throat> so with that, uh, let me quickly walk you through the consensus report. Uh, you've already heard about the Con Council of State Governments and the membership association that we are representing all three branches of government. Uh, let me talk a little bit about um, uh, why we want to focus on school discipline, but I think you've already gotten uh, a really good sense of that. You know how commonplace this is across the country. You know now that when you talk to kids, um, it's more the exception uh, that uh, a kid has not experienced suspension, which is so different than the experience that we had um, as adults going to school uh, not that long ago. Um, again, you can see here that this is happening to millions of kids across the country. Senator Whitmire talked about a study done in Texas. Uh, one of the amazing findings that we had in that study was that it's not a one-time event. 15% of all kids in the state of Texas experience suspension 11 or more times. Um, so if you're not getting it on the sixth or seventh time, what leads us to believe that you're getting it on the 12th or 13th time? Um, we also know, as was mentioned before, 
that there is racial disproportionality uh, in these suspension rates with African Americans in particular being overrepresented among those youth uh, experiencing suspension. So, so many reports that have been coming out, so much information since this issue has really been brought to the forefront over the past few years, first by advocates and then more and more research. What's different about this report? Well, uh, and first is, is we want to make sure that everybody understands how uh, key this is to the goals that people have in education, right? About making people feel supported and welcome in school, about closing the achievement gap, uh, about improving high school graduation rates, and about reducing the number of youth in contact with the juvenile justice system. We cannot accomplish those goals, as was said earlier, unless we do something about school discipline. And just in case you think this is now just maybe, a, first maybe you thought it was just Los Angeles, or now maybe California, but you're also hearing Texas, but look at all the cities across the country just, just within the last couple of years that have overhauled their school codes of conduct. Uh, we know of uh, well over a dozen just in the last two years of big city schools that have overhauled their school codes of conduct. Look at these states that have just passed legislation in the last legislative session, including yours here, uh, to change the approach to school discipline. And when we factor in school climate, you can see that this is really a national groundswell that's occurring. And we can see that we're getting results. California, as Dan Lawson will talk about, seeing declines in suspensions, not just here in Los Angeles, but statewide, although Superintendent Deasy under, helped us understand why any trends we see statewide um, are occurring in part thanks to Los Angeles. Um, and, and then we also have statistics from Texas showing that since, just since the report came out in 2011, there's been a 10% decline uh, in in-school suspensions and a 5% decline in out-of-school suspensions statewide. And what's different about this report is that it's coming from the field. This is not coming from inside the Beltway. Um, this is coming, not coming from some research-based think tank. It's coming from all of you, parents and youth, uh, law enforcement, educators, police chiefs, juvenile court judges, um, everybody who has a stake in this issue. And it represents a consensus. All of these folks uh, agreeing on what makes sense, and it's comprehensive. It looks at this through the lens of not only conditions for learning in the classroom, but also local law enforcement, uh, health issues uh, and the juvenile justice system. It was made possible not only by the California Endowment by also, but also the federal government, um, the Secretary of the Department of Education uh, and the uh, United States Attorney General announced this initiative just two days after the Texas report was released and partnered with a number of foundations to make it possible. Okay, so what is in this report? Um, well first uh, I want to talk about conditions for learning and I want to highlight four chapters uh, in particular in the report, but conditions for learning are what you feel when you come into this school here at Garfield, where you feel that um, there is an environment where everybody in that school wants kids to succeed. And we know this is one of the single most important things uh, to creating an environment where teachers are not depending on suspensions to manage uh, student behavior. I want to give you some concrete examples of what we're talking about here. First of all, in terms of the school code of conduct, what if the school code of conduct didn't just outline uh, the consequences of misbehavior, but what if the school code of conduct made clear what the expectations were in terms of positive student behavior for those kids who were there? What if it also made clear that the last thing that should happen, the last resort, is suspension, and that when suspension occurs, it should remove the child not from just the entire school campus, but have an alternate location uh, on that school campus? There should be a host of graduated responses and restorative responses that we'll hear more from the panel on. And we also need to make sure that teachers are provided with the skills to manage these classrooms. We all remember the teacher who could put her finger to the lips and achieve instant silence in the classroom, and we contrast that with a teacher who was presiding over a very chaotic classroom and screaming but not getting any response, right? These skills to manage that classroom are not instinctive to a 23-year-old um, who's been focusing a lot on how to deliver curriculum. This is difficult stuff that you have to learn. Um, those are skills that we have to teach and have to be emphasized, and the report looks at that. We highlight Baltimore School District, for example, and what the superintendent there has done in making a priority of reducing suspensions and the corresponding improvement in test scores that we've seen. And let me just give you one example out of Baltimore that I think really illustrates what we're talking about. In Baltimore, they had the phenomenon that all schools have across the country where a student gets irritated, frustrated, just doesn't want to be in the classroom and announces at a certain point that he's had it for the day. Uh, teacher then got into a verbal confrontation with that student. Uh, suddenly it was a clash of who was going to win that particular argument. The student then stood up and impressed his other students across the classroom and said, I'm out of here, I'm walking out. The teacher then felt that his or her authority was being disrespected. That teacher would sometimes get in the doorway to blockade the student from leaving. That student then put his hands on the teacher. We know what's going to happen in that situation. We're going to be calling police. As soon as we're calling police, we then have a referral to the juvenile justice system. And this is the 
downward spiral that we have where a kid gets sucked into the juvenile justice system. What if in that situation where, and we know these kids are going to continue to go through these kinds of issues, instead of the teacher blockading the doorway, what if the teacher stepped to the side and said, well, you needed a cooling off period. That student walked out of the classroom and there was a very clear place where that student had to go. There was another person waiting in that cooling off room where that student had to interact with that other person, mentor, and actually uh, hear from that person what kind of behaviors were expected. That, that kind of strategy keeps the person on the school campus and gets very different results. We talk also in the report about targeted behavioral interventions and dealing with those students that Principal Huerta mentioned earlier who may have unmet uh, behavioral health needs. Um, we talk about a host of strategies, early warning systems um, that help target students that would benefit from additional intervention, student support teams to interact with those youth, uh, and then making sure that when students are removed, they can be put in a quality education setting. We talked about the Austin School District here that has a system not only for identifying those youth, but connecting them with supportive school teams and the kinds of results they're seeing there. It was mentioned earlier the key role that police can play uh, in partnership with the school. We heard Principal Huerta describe what a fantastic partnership you have here with, with uh, local police. The report doesn't take a position on whether we should or should not have police on campus, but rather every school should go through a process to determine what makes sense for it. We shouldn't necessarily end up in a situation where uh, a partnership um, or a, a, an arrangement with the police has suddenly been imposed. Um, rather, this should be the result of a conversation with school leaders, community leaders, and local law enforcement. And we also know that when we do decide to have a police presence on campus, there should be processes for identifying those police officers and properly training them. We also know the role of that police officer should not be to help manage classroom behaviors, but rather to deal with other kinds of situations. And these agreements should be documented in a memorandum of understanding, and we highlight Denver, Colorado, and what they've done there. And juvenile courts, and Judge Groman was a big part of this, we talk about what we need to do to make sure that kids don't come into contact with the juvenile justice system. Uh, we talk about how hard it is just to get good data that indicates what uh, referrals are coming directly from the courts, or excuse me, directly from the schools to the courts. Very few counties across the country can tell you what percentage of kids who are in the juvenile justice system are coming as a direct result of a referral from schools. We need to get better data in this area. We also need to help develop arrangements where we're in agreement about what kind of information will come to juvenile court judges that can help inform their diversion decisions. And when a kid is incarcerated, we need to make sure they get exposure to a quality education. We highlight George and what's being done there to reduce the number of referrals to the juvenile justice system. So over 60 recommendations, you know, hundreds of pages of, of ideas, where in the world do we start? There isn't one place to start in the report. There isn't one recommendation that's more important than another. We think that uh, every state's different, every school district unique, um, every school distinct. Uh, and really what the first step needs to be is to bring together uh, the people uh, in that community to really think through and look at that report and decide what makes the, the best priority for it, giving the opportunities uh, and the needs. When that working group does get assembled, one thing that's extremely important is that they have data available to them. Senator Whitmire mentioned earlier uh, that, in fact, there's a, a number of states that don't have that kind of data. And California used to be in that category uh, until you all made some recent changes. Uh, but just as an example, um, uh, nine states across the country currently do not have publicly reported information about suspensions. So uh, right off the bat, I can tell you that there's a number of states that don't have any suspension data that they're providing to the public. Um, as well as to policymakers. Of the 41 states that do provide some public information, only 22 can tell us how many individual students experience suspension uh, each year. So less than half the states can tell us how many students experience suspension each year. And as of those, of those 22 states, only 17 can tell us the race, gender, um, and of those students, they can tell us what kinds of misbehavior they're being removed from the classroom for. California now has that data, but it's only recent. Many states have yet to get to even that point, and that's a key part of the report. And then, probably most important, we need to make sure, and this has been emphasized earlier, success is not simply reducing suspensions. Success is actually making sure that all students in the classroom feel safer, more welcome, and more supported. How do we know that? We ask students questions like, is there a single adult that you feel in this school campus actually cares for you and wants you to succeed? Do you feel that the rules are fair and administered in a fair way? We need to see the results of those questions and know that all students feel that, yes, uh, those are the answers to those questions. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, we can know that not only are we reducing suspensions, but we're making kids uh, feel safer and more supported in the classroom. And when that happens, we will see attendance rates improve, we'll see academic achievement increase, 
and we'll see school safety. So these are things that all need to happen in conjunction with each other, and that's the true goal of the report, not just reducing suspensions, but seeing all these things happen collectively. It's a real thrill to be talking about this, uh, not only in California, but in Los Angeles in particular, where there's so much momentum around this topic, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. So thank you very, very much. So to my fellow panelists, we now have Mission Impossible, uh, 30 minutes um, and a lot more of information to, uh, to get through and some wonderful perspectives to hear from. Uh, Dan Lawson is going to show us some of the recent data uh, from Los Angeles and California that's be, uh, being released just today and, and I think is really exciting um, and also shows us, uh, as many others said, the road that still lies ahead of us. Um, Dan Lawson is a nationally known researcher. Um, who's really been at the forefront of this issue for many, many years. He was country before country was cool uh, on this topic. And so, um, Dan, appreciate you um, and all you've been doing. Um, I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint right now, I think. Um, did I do it right? Uh, is this it? Uh, Eric, we need your help again. Um, all right, but Dan, come on over. Thank you so much. Uh, there's really inspiring work going on in California and Texas and also across the nation. And I'm really inspired by the work of the, the consensus report and the work of the Council of State Governments. And it's a real honor to be asked to be part of the rollout of this report and to, to be you know, part of a panel of so many effective change makers on this issue. Um, we, this is a little bit of a teaser because we have our, uh, a brief California data report with data on every district in the state uh, coming out on Tuesday. And so I just want to go over some of the, the points very briefly. Uh, we, enti we entitled the report, uh, Keeping California Kids in School, Fewer Students of Color Missing School for Minor Misbehavior, because the data really show that this is going on. Um, for starters, uh, and some of these points have already been made, but we really focus as the, the Center for Civil Rights Remedies at the Civil Rights Project at UCLA, we focus on the civil rights implications of this work. And it's really important to break down the data annually, disaggregate, disaggregated data uh, by race, ethnicity, but also um, future reports uh, coming out this summer will also include race with disability and gender and other categories, English learners is also very important. But for this report that we're presenting and will be coming out on Tuesday, uh, we just focused on out of school suspensions and just on race and ethnicity. And you see it's a, it's a real story of progress. And again, California has annual data reported to the public and so that we can see the progress and it can, uh, we can build on the momentum that's going on in the state and elsewhere. And it's really important uh, to note that uh, black students uh, made the most progress in just one year. So the first uh, set of numbers is from 11-12, the next set is from 12-13. So they reduced the suspensions out of school for black students across the state by three students per 100 enrolled. But all the racial groups, all the groups were making progress and there was a, a, a real significant narrowing of the racial gap. Now, it's a mixed bag, and of course, as a civil rights, someone who's concerned about civil rights, and the, especially with regard to historically disadvantaged kids, the gaps I just showed you are outrageous still, and every member of the panel here that's been doing this great work acknowledges that there's more work to be done. And you see that when we looked at um, just the reductions of out-of-school suspensions in every district in California, uh, we found that there were 500 districts that had reduced out-of-school suspensions. And that represents 4.7 million students. So that's, that's a real sign of progress. The most important takeaway message nationally and for districts across California is that this can be done. This is not an academic theory of what could be done. It's happening and it can be done and more really has to be done uh, to address the civil rights of students. So on the other on the flip side, 245 school districts in California increased out-of-school suspensions per 100. Now, we further broke this down and looked at the racial gap between black and Latino, and I mean, black and white, and Latino and white, and other racial groups. And we looked at what was going on. We found that there was tremendous progress made in many districts with reducing out-of-school suspensions for these different subgroups when we looked at out-of-school suspensions generally. 
And when we looked at this category that's been discussed uh, because Los Angeles has eliminated it, the category of disruption and willful defiance, and we looked at the districts in California that had the largest racial gaps, what we found was that a tremendous amount of that difference, that those racial gaps, was due to this one category. There are 24 ways to suspend a student out of school in California. One category in these districts that have large racial gaps, one category, disruption, willful defiance, accounted for between 26 and 71 percent of that racial gap. So a great deal could be done if we eliminate that category. A lot of the, the, the great reduction in the use of out-of-school suspensions, and remember, this is the most subjective category, uh, and we heard examples of how subjective it can be. It's the minor offense category. There is really no educational, educationally sound justification for, for suspending students out of school for these kinds of minor offenses. And this comes in the context of this report is being released in the context of other work going on nationally. So in January, the Department of Justice and the Office for Civil Rights released guidance to schools and districts across the nation, basically saying there is an obligation to look at your data and address uh, excessive discipline, especially when there are disparities by race and gender and disability status. And moreover, in California, there's another opportunity to make change. So we have the local control funding formula, uh, we have districts getting funding and they have to have an action plan and they can and one of the things they have to address in that action plan is school climate so before I get uh, in more detail about our recommendations with what could be done there it's important to uh, to discuss the the, uh, the disparate impact guidance from the Office for Civil Rights which basically says to districts and schools ask three questions uh, is there is there a disparity uh, is you're, you're, are you suspending kids? Is this educationally necessary? And even if it is, are there less discriminatory alternatives? And the real power of the consensus report is that it gives very concrete examples of district after district that has found alternatives that reduce the racial gap, reduce the use of out-of-school suspension substantially. So these are things that can be done, and these are questions that have to be asked. And moreover, I should point out that here in Los Angeles, you know, this is not a gotcha issue because here in Los Angeles um, the district entered into an OCR uh, an agreement with the federal government to address racial disparities in discipline and this is what they've done in just one year so that dis that that in and that that um, agreement w involved community members involved uh, researchers and the superintendent and it was an amicable agreement because everyone was on the same page they knew they could do it and they took action and you see dramatic reduction, especially in the group that was uh, m being suspended most frequently, black students, and, uh, and Superintendent D.C. already went over those numbers. But it's really important to know that working with the federal government, a lot can be done and, and has been done and can be accomplished. So going back to what could be done in the state in terms of um, local, the, the, the action plan that every district has to submit and addressing school climate, there, there are a number of things that they, that uh, one, uh, one of the most important is to look at the data every year and to analyze that and to do it next to your achievement data and look at it disaggregated by race and ethnicity, by disability status, English learner status, and come up with a, some ideas for addressing these disparities, including looking at the research and figuring out what is effective. There are several examples in the consensus report, and I encourage, and, and in fact, all these recommendations to LCAP can be found in the consensus report. So there are things about how to address, real examples about how to address school climate, real examples about how to invest in alternatives, things like restorative practices, social emotional learning, um, and uh, school-wide positive behavioral interventions and support. So real things that can be invested in. And also to provide the training uh, so that these kinds of interventions can be implemented with integrity. So that's, I think, critically important. And in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there and just point out that there, one, our report is coming out on Tuesday, and it will, you can find it on uh, schooldisciplinedata.org and also on the, on the website of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. Uh, but there's also good examples for those who are districts still involved in drafting their action plan for LCAP. Uh, I've been told that Fresno has an excellent example, and, and there's a site uh, listed here uh, for all those interested. 
Uh, the the uh, there's a there's another website, Fix School. Uh, what? Hold on, I can't read it without my glasses. But it, there's a, there's another website. Uh, I think it's called. Let's see, Fix. Fix School Discipline. Not so hard to remember. And um, there are comprehensive recommendations for districts and how to. Uh, what, what kinds of things to put in the, the LCAP, the, the action plans. Um, there's also, I'm part of the, the uh, Disparities and Discipline Research Collaborative, and there's a wealth of new research, especially looking at racial disparities, and that's also available uh, on our website as well as at Indiana University at the Equity Project. Uh, and finally, there's also contact information for me, and I list uh, the, con the where you can find the guidance from the federal government and the Department of Justice and, and the Office for Civil Rights for the U.S. Department of Ed. There's, there's information there. There's actually a, 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 some very detailed information, not only about compliance with the law, but also about other resources. So thank you very much, um, and I just want to applaud uh, the Council of State Governments and this report. It's just a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And again, uh, one of the things that we're excited about here is having just a, a terrific group um, that have been fantastic advisors on this project, and they've been waiting patiently here uh, at this table, and it's their perspective that's actually the one that's informed this entire report. So we want to be able to, uh, to hear from them. Um, if you don't mind, um, I'm just going to ask you to stay seated, and you can use a microphone from where you are. Um, and I first want to introduce uh, Dr. Ramona uh, Bishop, who's the superintendent uh, at the Vallejo City Unified School District in California. Um, she's been there since 2011. She has a long, uh, successful career uh, as an educator and as an administrator. And I know she really got all of our attention and the attention of all of the advisors uh, to this project uh, when we were grouped together and she addressed them. And we all heard what was possible uh, given the leadership of a superintendent who really had this in their sights. So Superintendent Bishop, thank you so much for being here. We'd love to hear a few words from you. Thank you. Um, I am just really humbled and honored to be a part of this auspicious panel and uh, really appreciative to the um, school discipline consensus report and the um, Council of State Governments and the California Endowment and all of those that are responsible for this gathering. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, why this is important. Really, um, when you think about our students and you think about the fact that the first suspension could lead a student on the pipeline to prison, then that's why this is important. And I want us to really pause and think about that. Um, the senator, the assemblymen are champions for this. There's a reason for it because we will change lives by truly taking all of these recommendations and doing something about them. And I want to say something else. There are no quick fixes. So when I hear dramatic drops in suspension in one year, I wonder, when I go to the school, how many students am I going to see in some room with some parent or classified employee not learning? If we're not suspending, where are the students going if we haven't put real supports in place for them? I wonder, have we disaggregated the data by teacher? Because often it is not a student issue, it's a teacher issue. I wonder, do we have the will to really say, teacher, I'm going to help you. As principal, I'm going to help you get what you need to ensure that all students in your class are successful. So let's really, as community members, as community advocates, as educators, have the will to ask the tough questions. And as educators, we have to stop waiting for the Office of Civil Rights to come in and tell us our data is disproportionate. We must do that. And so that's what we did in the Vallejo City Unified School District. My school district is 14,500 students, and they're very important to me, every one of them. As an educator, my job is to ensure that every one of them graduates from high school, college, and career ready. 
My 14,500 students are broken down. 30% of them are African American. 30% of them are Latino. 20% of them are Filipino. When I got to Vallejo three years ago, I'm the longest standing superintendent in 10 years, by the way. There was a revolving door before I got there. When I got there, one out of two of our students was not graduating from high school. We were one of the top 10 suspending districts in the state of California. I, the senator, I need your autograph because all of my uh, community read the Texas study. After we looked at the data, we read the Texas study together to figure out what is it that we needed to do. Not only how serious this problem is, but what is it that we needed to do. What you also know about Vallejo is that it's the first city in the nation to file bankruptcy. Our students were walking around the streets doing what it is we do when we don't have an education, unemployed, getting into crime, all of those things, economy tanks, Mare Island leaves, and we're left with a city full of students that have nothing to do. So what we have done in the last three years has been remarkable. It has been remarkable. We have had positive behavior intervention support training for not only for the educators, but for the parents, the community members, everyone. Over 250 community members are completely trained in positive behavior intervention support. We have rolled out full service community schools. Thank you. <laughs> and just received a national award for having done so. But full service community schools are serious business. You can't just say you're a full service community school if you don't have a staff member. So every one of our schools has a staff member called an academic support provider, and that person's whole job is to ensure that Johnny has whatever Johnny needs to make sure that Johnny will graduate from high school. Whether it's food, whether it's the parent needs a job, if it's the ha whatever it is, that person's job is to facilitate ensuring that, that, that Johnny is connected to whatever supports he needs to graduate from high school. And we have gotten a lot of attention around this. Kaiser has been an amazing partner. In fact, what they'll be doing is next year we'll have six medical residents, the following year we'll have 12, the following year after that we'll have 18 medical residents that we own trained in trauma-informed care practices so that when Johnny comes to school having had some issue at home or the teacher comes to school having had some issue at home then that issue will be taken care of and lastly what we have done is to really make sure Garfield is a wonderful example of this in fact we studied it when we were preparing to put wall-to-wall -wall academies in both of our high schools. We have two comprehensive high schools, and both of them have wall-to-wall -wall academies. We just got a $6 million grant, the Career Pathways Trust. We're very excited about that, to build out those academies. Our 50% dropout rate has gone to, now we have a 65% graduation rate, and we are ticking away at that one student at a time. Here's the last thing I'll say. This report is so comprehensive. If you haven't read beyond the executive summary, shame on you. Read the whole report. It is so comprehensive. And it really talks about, additionally, the fact that what has occurred is that we have students who make a mistake. Students who make a mistake, they get on probation. And then we don't want to accept them back in their, our schools. We want to close our doors to students who have made a mistake, often for their own survival. And so we are honored to have been the only school district in the state to receive Sierra Health Foundation and California Endowments, um, what is it called? Positive Youth Justice Initiative Grant. And the Positive Youth Justice Initiative Grant has provided a liaison so that when our students make a mistake, they have a person that visits them. If they get locked up, goes, visits them, connects with them, because guess what, community? 
eventually Johnny is coming back to your house. And if we don't have a connection with Johnny, if Johnny does, does not think that we care about him, he's going to come back to the community and do what? The same thing he did to get locked up in the first place. So through that grant, we have a linkage between probation and the school district, and Johnny gets exactly what he needs to turn his life around, graduate, and be successful. I would suggest to you that I am so proud to be in California right now. I would suggest to you that this local control accountability plan is going to transform lives if we take it seriously. If we have included our students seriously, our parents seriously, in the creation of that plan. Not the students that have a 3.0 GPA, but the students who are leaders on our campus. I'll close by saying this. I did small groups with my students. I showed them the data in every one of the eight priority areas. I didn't leave out the continuation high school. And in the continuation high school, they said to me, Dr. Bishop, it's really too late for us, but can you ensure that our brothers and sisters, our nieces and nephews, have a powerful teacher in every classroom? Can you do a better job at that, at hiring people that really care about us, that know Vallejo? Can you make sure that we have field trips? And I thought, yeah, Discovery Kingdom, we're not going to be taking you to Discovery Kingdom. That's not what they meant. They meant, can we have early field trips to colleges so we know what they look like? Can we go to museums? So in our local control accountability plan, we have accounted for those things with that extra $10 million that we got from the state. We didn't just dust off an old plan and rebrand it for the local control accountability plan. We made some serious changes in what is it, we, it is that we expect from our system. And we challenged ourselves. Yet I can tell you that if you are, do not have a strong backbone, that you will just recreate the old news. Let me jump in there. And thank you. Dr. Bishop, thank you very, very much. For <laughs> you can see why out of the thousands of superintendents across the country, we're thrilled to have Dr. Bishop in particular as our, uh, one of our expert advisors. Um, another one of our expert advisors on this project from right here in Los Angeles uh, is Judge Donna Groman, who's a juvenile court judge in here, uh, right here in this county, um, has spent her whole life um, focusing on different aspects of these issues in the legal system, um, and was really a key driving force in all the recommendations in this report in particular that focus on the interface between schools and the juvenile justice system. Judge Groman, thank you for being here. So we have heard that uh, crime rates are declining that the numbers of juvenile arrests are declining, but it's not good enough when we have uh, children who are being um, forced into the juvenile justice system who are low risk, who are merely there because they're disconnected from the education system. We know through research that uh, the mere entry into the juvenile justice system, whether it's um, going to a meeting with a probation officer or having a district attorney file a petition against them or walking into the courthouse, these all have profound effects on our children. And we must take it very seriously when we uh, inject our youth into this process of juvenile justice. Now, there are many youth who do need to be in the juvenile justice system, and uh, we um, do a very good job in providing services and rehabilitation to them. But I think it's very important that judges take leadership to make sure that those cases that don't belong there, those 10-year-olds that we get from the middle schools who got into school fights, who uh, graffitied a bathroom, 
who threatened a teacher, um, that their actions are a result of mental health issues, uh, suffering uh, from trauma, that we not um, exacerbate their situation by placing them into the juvenile justice system. You take a low-risk youth, and I see so many young students who are sent to court, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. Middle school seems to be a real ground for, um, for activity by uh, school police and uh, law enforcement to cite, arrest, and send our young people to court. But what really happens when they come to court? If they come uh, to our court and they're sitting out in the waiting room outside, they're sitting there with uh, youngsters that have uh, serious um, issues, are gang involved, have committed violent crimes. And believe me, I love all of my kids. But you don't want to put young children in the midst of um, older youth who have more serious problems. You don't want these young uh, children to start thinking of themselves as criminals, because that's just the beginning of the end of their ability to succeed in school. So for all of these reasons, it's very important for judges to take leadership in this issue, to work with schools, to get um, all of the agencies to understand there is a place for juvenile justice, but it's not a place for our young people who have committed minor offenses, who are there for school discipline issues, because we could do better for them. Those young people who come to our court, they come 60 days after an offense is committed. And in that time, they may be out of school the entire time, and then they come to our court, and we still don't provide them any help until they're placed on probation. And that could be months and months and months later. What we need to provide to our youth and families is an immediate response. And that immediate response must happen at the school. The school is the center of the community. The school is a familiar place. The school has the capacity to provide that immediate assistance that the juvenile justice system is just not good at providing. So in this school consensus report, you will see many suggestions of how judicial leadership can accomplish many of these things. And I want to make it absolutely clear, we're not trying to get rid of cases because we work too hard. <laughs> we want to make sure that children are not harmed by coming through the juvenile justice system. And that's the reason why judges should take leadership in this issue. Judges have a unique ability to be able to convene people. You get a call from the judge or an email from the judge and you get a very uh, good response. Uh, people are willing to come forward and to sit down. And we've had a, a great collaboration here in Los Angeles uh, with school police, with community leaders, uh, with mental health, with the courts, the DAs, the defense attorneys, and we have been able to make inroads towards reducing the number of school referrals uh, to the court. In the consensus report, you have a blueprint for action along these lines, and for those young people who are in the justice system, also guidelines about um, the effectiveness of the education that they're getting if they happen to be incarcerated. And also that very important issue that Dr. Bishop just mentioned about re-entry and how we have to have a seamless transition from uh, detention uh, to the community. And I can't help but shout out to Ruben Carranza who's sitting there in front of me who has, developed, who has developed a program for um, assisting young people with disabilities, those with IEPs. He specializes in those young people returning 
to schools because they present uh, very special challenges. So I too am humbled and grateful to have been part of this project. And uh, I'm just so delighted to see this going nationwide, knowing that the legislatures will respond to this, that community leaders, and law enforcement, and all the other partners will take heed because this is a consensus report. And uh, lots of effort was put into this to reach uh, agreement. So, uh, Yes, read the whole report, <laughs> 650 Thank pages. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge, and thanks again for modeling that kind of judicial leadership that you spoke about. Um, next, we have uh, Mac Jenkins, who's the chief of the San Diego County Probation. Um, that's his title, but for those of you who track uh, criminal justice issues and politics here in California, I can tell you that not only is he, is he the chief of San Diego County Probation, but he's also the president of the uh, Association of Chief Probation Officers across the state. And for those of you who may wonder, well, what, what exactly does that do? Well, um, I've actually uh, witnessed Governor Brown uh, sitting down and talking to uh, all the chief probation officers and wanting to talk in particular to the president of the chief probation officers. And so when you talk about one of the voices that um, has some of the, the greatest influence in criminal justice policy in the state here, it's great to have Chief Jenkins um, be also part of our consensus project. So Chief, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I am privileged as well, um, one, to be here and to have actually played a role in um, putting together this consensus report because it talks about, obviously, a really critically important issue. Um, and this is actually, I want to add to Michael's description of me, this, in terms of my bio, this is my 36th year as a probation employee and in the uh, juvenile justice system. So I've seen it change. I've seen it evolve. And I've seen it come to a point right now where, as Judge uh, Grumman talked about, we're actually seeing some uh, record lows, quite frankly, in terms of arrests around the state and, and kids that are in the system. But we are not done yet. What I want to talk about is how um, juvenile justice officials, probation officers like myself can use this report um, and how we can partner with other um, educational leaders and um, others that have an interest in the uh, welfare of uh, children. I also like what Michael said earlier in terms of the report itself is more than just being about not suspending kids. It really is about um, helping kids succeed in, in an environment where, when I kind of wrote this down myself, where they feel like they can study and learn to fully achieve their potential. I think that's really what this report is about. And there was reference also early, too, about the pipeline um, from the juvenile justice system, frankly, even the cradle to prison. And I want to talk a little bit about that, and then I'll make some real specific comment on some recommendations in the report. Because I'm very familiar with this pipeline, but I'm not sure the entire public is. And that pipeline is not hidden. That pipeline is not a secret. We actually know the kinds of kids, what the kids look like, who are on that trajectory, who are on that path from problems in school, through the juvenile justice system, on to prison. So I'm going to tell you exactly who the chronic delinquents are. Chronic delinquents. And by chronic delinquents, I mean the kids who did, do get caught up into the juvenile justice system and they don't get out. The chronic delinquents in the system, this is a study that's been validated here in California and across the country, end up and are responsible for more than 55% of all juvenile crime. And here's what their characteristics look like. Their first entry into the system is before age 13. Um, one of the second elements is that they have begun to dabble in drug and alcohol use beyond mere experimentation. Another characteristic is their primary peer group is other delinquents, They're not hanging out with the other A students or A students and things like that. Their primary peer group is other delinquents. A fourth characteristic is that they have experienced some level of family dysfunction. That could be that they're being raised in a single family home. That could be that they're being raised in a home with parental criminality. That could be that they have had a parent tragically die or be killed or things like that. But they've come from some family dysfunction. But the fifth, and it's really important about why we're here today, is that they have had academic failure. Academic failure meaning that they may have had early involvement in truancy, they may have been disengaged in their classrooms, they may have, for whatever reason, and they may have been expelled or suspended from school. 
Now, frankly, you don't have to have all five to be a chronic delinquent. If you have three of those, when we see you in the juvenile justice system, you are not going to self-correct. The trajectory for you in that situation is to become a chronic delinquent. So this report gives tools and gives recommendations for schools, but not just schools. Juvenile justice practitioners in partnership with schools to help kind of recognize those youth and interject the, on that trajectory. Um, I also, as um, Dr. Bishop talked about the fact that um, uh, her school district had received a um, positive youth justice initiative, I will say very proudly that my probation department is one of only four in the state to have received the same um, award, which is specifically focused on both at-risk youth and youth who actually have come into the system for the purpose of improving their outcomes. And, and one of the things that my staff, and we are learning as a, as a result of participating in this grant opportunity, and I will say this, this is not something that juvenile justice practitioners have necessarily learned. I told you, I'm 36 years in the system. Nobody told me about this a little while ago, but the impact of trauma on the youth in the system. I gave you the characteristics. Remember I told you one of the characteristics was family dysfunction, some level of family dysfunction. What we know better now today is that those youth actually have been traumatized. So those of us that are gonna be entrusted with their care need to necessarily be trained in the impacts of trauma. Um, uh, being in a, involved in this project and as well, working with other uh, educational partners, I've become familiar with this term willful defiance. Is that the term that's used? And in the, probation, in the probation world, we call that contempt of PO. <laughs> but what we know more now that we didn't know before is, is how often that behavior that we give that label is a result of a traumatic experience and an adaptation that the youth are going through. So now my officers are in a better position to kind of learn and recognize that and in partnership with our you know, educational partners and community partners to better respond. So, um, and that through this positive youth justice initiative, we're learning about the impacts of trauma and we're learning about um, just how we can collaborate together in a, in a better way to improve those outcomes. The report does, again, has 60 different recommendations, but I just want to really talk about a couple in terms of the importance of tracking the data of how school discipline policies do relate to referrals to the juvenile justice system. And it also talks about the importance of, and I may mis misspeak on the language, assessing and diverting um, appropriate youth from entry into the system, it's, which is critically important. And I will say that there have been advances made along those lines in the juvenile justice system. In my county, over the last four years, there's been a 44% decline in the number of referrals to the, to the justice system and a 35% decline in the number of youth being adjudicated delinquent and actually being placed on probation caseloads. But what that does mean, and this also speaks to a point in the report, is those kids who have penetrated into the system, as Judge Groman talked about, for, for me in San Diego County, 80% of them are high risk. So that the means, arguably, you know, that they certainly should be there because the low risk kids are not, but it does mean that there's a need for us to look that much deeper into what their issues and what their needs are so that we can satisfactorily serve them. And the report talks about the importance of re-entry planning from an educational standpoint. I'm also very pleased to say, and the report alludes to this as well, that there really does need to be a strong relationship between a probation entity and our educational partners. The superintendent of the San Diego County Office of Education meets with my executive staff once a quarter. And we collaboratively plan and discuss how we can meet the educational issues of the youth that are actually in the system while we're still working on keeping um, kids out of the system that don't need to penetrate. So um, I'm anxious to continue to go through the report and continue to engage with some of my partners because this is that critical of an issue. It is that critical of an issue. The tie between what happens with kids in their educational environment and how they respond to the way that they're treated and those that do end up coming into the justice system, um, one, they're not a lost cause. You'll never hear me say that a child that's been placed on probation is a lost cause. And I don't let my staff talk that way either. It's an opportunity for us to fulfill what I believe are the purposes of the juvenile court and the purposes of a probation department to, op 
to focus on that, those kids' best interest from a family's perspective. The child is never just a single focus. It should always be about the family and the family environment to help improve some of those outcomes. So um, with that. Thank you very much, Chief Jenkins. So how appropriate um, to begin or to end where we began so much in, in this work and then begin yet again, if that makes any sense. Um, but uh, as Maisie knows, um, it was 10, 15 years ago uh, where you didn't have the Attorney General and the U.S. Secretary of the Department of Education talking about this. There weren't state legislative leaders and, and superintendents all making this a priority. Um, there were some students and some parents and their champions uh, in the advocacy field. Um, who really helped bring this issue front and center. And when you go nationally and we talk about those kinds of advocates, uh, mm -hmm. everyone talks about Maisie Chin in particular and modeling that kind of leadership. So Maisie, it's, uh, it's so important for us to be here in Los Angeles and thank you again for your work in this area and know that uh, we're only in the, uh, the first or second quarter of the game here. We have a lot more to go, but we appreciate all the progress we've made so far and we're looking forward to hearing from you and then also from a student perspective. So Maisie, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, thank you, and I am fighting a cold, so please forgive me in advance if my vote is, voice is scratchy and raspy, but I am going to do my best to bring it, um, as I am also very humbled and honored to be on this panel. Um, but first and foremost, I'm only on this panel because there has been a movement of young people and parents from all over the country to bring this issue uh, to the forefront. And not only... Uh, has, were these words not uttered uh, in policymaking tables, but you also didn't see hundreds of students and parents at a time rallying and mobilizing in front of school districts and board uh, chambers uh, calling for new discipline codes and calling for an end to willful defiance and calling for uh, changes to how school police and tickets uh, and that whole system of contact with law enforcement operates inside our school buildings. And so in uh, honor of all of our allies and colleagues from all over the country, both who are in this room and listening live. Uh, I am only here and Cadre is only here because of the movement that we've all built together. So thank you on that, uh, on that tip for allowing all of us to be part of this conversation because without a movement, we wouldn't have been here. Um, and let's face it, before there's data and before there's statistics, there are students having a really bad day at school and having a really funky thing happened that sometimes at the time doesn't seem like it's going to ruin your whole life, but it does. And then there are parents who they have to maybe tell their story to, and maybe because of the way that our schools are often, um, unfortunately, uh, pitting their parents against their own children, the parents are, have to figure out whether or not to believe their children and whether or not to speak up and speak to a Dr. Bishop, speak to a principal, and say, you know what, what happened to my child was not okay. And that takes an incredible amount of courage. And again, before there is data, before there is statistics, before there's a movement, it takes hundreds and thousands of those things happening. Um, and a lot of incredible courage uh, for those parents who are their children's advocates uh, to defend their children's humanity, to speak to uh, attorneys, to speak to uh, teachers, principals, et cetera, and, and really seek out uh, a remedy for that situation. And again, you know, everything that we are talking about today is the result of that. And unfortunately, um, you know, it's been said over and over again that we don't, we have come a long way and we have a lot more to do. Uh, and I'm going to add that we can't wait any longer. And I'm going to add that uh, this has also been going on for decades. And so the sense of urgency that we have to have uh, in this moment and every moment going forward uh, is times 10. And CADRE, you know, is a community-based organization, as many of you have heard. We have been organizing parents uh, in South Central Los Angeles since 2001, specifically to challenge um, uh, and, and promote the fact that children must be rightfully educated regardless of where they live. And, you know, we decided to focus on this issue in 2005 when there were 72,868 suspensions in LA Unified School District, 92% of which were all African-American Latino children. And while today we may, next month we may hear that that district-wide number has gone down to the 10 to 20,000 level, 92% of them are still African-American and Latino children. And so despite the reductions, uh, it's the same kids who are getting suspended and the same families from the same communities that um, 
may or may not have their entire livelihoods affected by this one act at a school. And so uh, we came upon this issue by knocking on doors, uh, listening deeply to parents and not blaming them, uh, listening to uh, what they understood about what happened to their children, knowing that they probably didn't get all the information or that they might not have had due process when it happened or even notification of why their child was suspended or why they got a ticket. Oftentimes parents would tell us about a suspension leading to a citation and the citation being this crumpled up piece of paper that also didn't have much information on it. And suddenly you have a court case, you have fees, you have time missed from school, and, and a completely stressful situation on your hands. And that's how we came upon this issue as many of our allies around the country. And yes, it's been mentioned multiple times as a result of Kadri's efforts and in collaboration with other stakeholders, including youth organizing groups, and including fierce uh, child rights attorneys, including uh, a board member ally, educator allies, judges, um, who sent in letters to the LA Unified School District imploring them to adopt school-wide positive behavior support. And we did in 2007, and it made us the first district in the country to see people standing up and demanding a change in policy. And yes, um, we're extremely proud of that, just like we are proud of having worked with Oscars Coalition Brothers Sun Selves uh, to pass the School Climate Bill of Rights last year. Um, Assembly Member Dixon talked about uh, the state laws that have ch been changed and the way that California is just leading the country legislatively. And we're proud of that. We're proud of being a member of the Indian Schools Campaign and having helped create a huge movement where students, their parents, their f communities all over the country are now standing up to uh, end school push out and racial disparities. Um, but this report really puts us at our crossroads and it's an important one. Um, Kadri was part of this project. Uh, we certainly sat in these rooms and struggled over these issues. And as much as uh, consensus is uh, difficult to forge, you know, what we also hope is that all the stories that were heard along the way, all the difficult issues that have to be addressed just to have a consensus are also part of the solution. So, um, you know, I know that many of our allies uh, look at reports such as this one and will use this report to step up our monitoring uh, you know, efforts, to, to train our members, our young people, parents, uh, hopefully educators, to really examine their classroom levels, to, uh, to really look at what's happening, the conditions for learning, whether or not there are supports, whether or not young people and parents are being brought in to be part of the solution for shaping their school climate. Um, we can continue to knock on doors and let people know whether, you know, do they know that this is their right? Do they know that this is a tool for them? Do they know that they can expect more from their school climate? And do they know that if they work uh, with the many organizations that around the country that are working on this issue, that we might actually begin to really tackle the racial disparities in our education system? And, uh, you know, that's going to be a long road. That's a lot of work to do. And um, we certainly need the system leaders' uh, support to make sure this is uh, not just policy but practice, not just a framework but actual resources and financial investments, you know, so that we really can stand 10 deep between children and the juvenile justice system. Um, we, we can't wait any longer. We have a long way to go, but that way has to kind of be crossed in the next couple of years as we are losing students as we speak. And when Dr. Bishop mentioned that class of students who are always ability, uh, able and willing to look ahead for their brothers and sisters um, who are coming up behind them, um, you know, many of us who organize around this issue are doing the same thing. We're thinking about the families um, that are going to raise their children in this system and have to, and hopefully we'll have a more just, fair, and equitable climate in which to try to get an education. Um, and Truly, you know, we, we hope that this is just the beginning of having community at the table in all aspects of solving this problem. Uh, again, because before there is data, before there is statistics to study, uh, there are hundreds of lives being impacted, some never to be uh, restored or ret retrieved, quite frankly. And it's in their honor that we sit here at this table and any table that we sit at. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Maisie. Um, it's wonderful to have here today a graduate of, of Garfield High School. We keep talking about the Bulldogs. We've got a Bulldog at this table. So, um, Oscar, thank you very much for joining us to speak today. Um, and uh, Senator Whitmire and Selman Dickinson, this is a future political consultant you want to be hiring. He's a very effective organizer here. He's a uh, freshman, completed his freshman year um, at UC uh, Riverside, right nearby, and uh, has done a lot of organizing on this issue, and we're thrilled to have you. And Oscar, we'd love to hear your perspective on this. Okay. Hello everybody, my name is Oscar Loera, as uh, Michael said. I'm a first year political science public service major at UCR and I'm a graduate of this great uh, high school. Uh, during my time here at Garfield, I was called, um, joined many, uh, had the opportunity to join several clubs, uh, organizations, and extracurricular activities, um, such as Interact Club, Inner City Struggle, the UPP Council, uh, the Speech and Debate Team, and many other organizations. Uh, I took seven advanced placement classes and many other honors courses. Students like me are not difficult to find at Garfield anymore. Uh, in fact, students with impressive resumes can be found everywhere at Garfield now. However, although Garfield is now a place where it is expected for its students to succeed, uh, it hasn't always been that way. Uh, my freshman year uh, was the year before the, pol uh, the discipline policy changed here at Garfield. It was the complete opposite of the Garfield that exists today. Uh, hundreds of students were suspended that year. The school climate was horrible, and it was more common to hear about someone getting in trouble than it was uh, hearing about someone's academic achievements. Uh, whenever I passed by our old dean's office uh, during my freshman year in the old uh, building that we used to have, uh, I noticed that it would always be filled to the point where students had to wait outside to kind of get their little, their discipline, whatever, you know, and um, the former policy uh, that was in place created a culture of failure here at Garfield. Uh, most of the punitive uh, disciplinary policies here at Garfield required the students to be away from the classroom. I noticed uh, those who could, those who would miss a couple of days from uh, school due to suspensions usually fell far behind in their schoolwork. Uh, with the changes in the disciplinary policy, Garfield began improving immensely on every level. Our test scores uh, started vastly improving, our campus pride increased, and the number of suspensions uh, dropped to only one suspension, as of course you guys saw earlier today. Uh, it wasn't until my junior year when I uh, worked at the dean's office myself uh, that I realized that our new disciplinary policy had a lot to do with our improvements. Uh, while working at the dean's office, I noticed uh, the very low number of students in the dean's office. Every time someone would come in, uh, I would see the deans taking their time to speak to the students. Uh, I saw that they offered alternatives to suspensions and intervention when needed. Because of these practices, problems were solved and the culture of failure here at Garfield uh, died completely. Being part of inner city struggle, I know that a student's voice is critical. Uh, us students are the ones who experience school climate, and we know uh, what we need to succeed. Our stories and recommendations need to be heard by policymakers, educators, and stakeholders. Uh, Superintendent Daisy attended a BSS Youth Town Hall uh, meeting in March, uh, and at that meeting he told a group of at least 60 of my peers uh, to keep making our voices heard because he and his fellow peers cannot ignore the student's voice. And it's not just us. Across the country, youth are mobilizing uh, and advocating for changes to harsh disciplinary practices that remove students from school and prevent students from learning like we are doing in uh, LA and Long Beach. In Los Angeles, young men of color have the lowest life expectancy rates, highest unemployment rates, fewest high school and college graduates, and the, higher, and the highest murder victimization rate of any demographic group. The, the Brothers and Sons Coalition is a coalition of 12 community organizations in Los Angeles County and that all work together uh, to improve the lives of young men of color like myself, and I'm proud to be a member of this coalition. As a member of the Brothers and Selves Coalition, we work together with organizations like Cadre to advocate uh, for changes to the punitive and exclusionary uh, school discipline policies here in Los Angeles. In 2013, the Los Angeles Unified School District Board of Education passed the School Climb Bill of Rights because of the hard work and passionate advocacy of the Brothers and Selves Coalitions, its youth leaders, and other organizations who joined forces. Thanks to the to this dedication, LAUSD is the first uh, school district in the nation to say it will stop suspending students for willful defiance. That means students here, that means students here at Garfield are not getting suspended for, for getting a pencil or for having a bad day uh, or wearing a hat. Since a single suspension doubles the chance of that student dropping out or, and triples their chance of getting involved in the criminal justice system, no more, no more willful defiance. Uh, has meant we are no longer needlessly pushing my peers into vicious cycles and down negative paths. Though we helped pass the School Climb Bill of Rights a year ago, we are still mobilizing and advocating its full implementation. Ending willful defiance is only part of the solution. I saw firsthand 
uh, that my peers need supports. No more Wolf of Defiance means students are kept in school, but now we need to make sure that they are being supported and encouraged to grow. A fully implemented school climb bill of rights would redefine the role of police officers in school, would provide uh, schools with provisions to implement school-wide positive behavior interventions and supports, uh, and would place restorative justice programs and counselors in school. A fully implemented school climb bill of rights is essential for student success, especially for our boys uh, and men of color. That's why Brothers Sons Selves uh, Coalition is working very hard over the next month to demand that LAUSD use new money intended for uh, high-need students uh, to, to fully implement the Bill Climate, the Bill of Rights, uh, so that students, especially high-need students who experience the worst climates, start benefiting from positive behavior interventions and supports and restorative justice. Uh, thank you for your time. Oscar, thank you very, very much. While we're in agreement on what the problem is, we're energized about the progress to date, and we're all focused on a common set of recommendations. Thank you very, very much to all of you, and we look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you.